It's the Veterans Radio Hour. Proudly supported by McDonald's and their national salute to the U.S. military. Now, stay tuned for the Veterans Radio Hour next on the TRN Talk Radio Network. Tango Charlie Bravo, you're a go for the Veterans Hour. Hi, uh, she'll have a Happy Meal and I'll have the Big Mac. Dad, when will I be old enough for a Big Mac? When you're in college. College. Now, when you register specially marked McDonald's gift certificates at youpromise.com, a portion of the value goes into a YouPromise account for a child's education. So, the more specially marked gift certificates you buy, the more you'll save for college. I want to be a doctor. Hello, gift certificates. Sign up for free and get the details at youpromise.com. We love to see you smile. Welcome, one and all, to the Veterans Radio Hour. It's our tribute to all of those who served our great nation's armed forces, past and present, and their tremendous accounts of heroic duty and bravery. With your host, Brigadier General Dave Grange. And now, coming to you live from our Veterans Center studio, here is General Dave. Good evening and welcome back again to Veterans Radio Hour. Thank you for being with us. Tonight's show, What's Being Done for Disabled American Veterans, that's the theme. And uh, in the studio tonight, uh, we have some key people that have uh, given their time to, to discuss this subject. And we have some people that will be calling in uh, on the telephone to, to help us out with some of the questions that we have tonight. In the studio, the Veterans Center studio here tonight with us, we have the Warrenville VFW Post. Uh, 8081, a great organization. In fact, some of the things they're doing uh, for veterans and for the community, they have a bike ride for cancer the 29th of September this year. And then in Thanksgiving, they're going to host 50 sailors from the Great Lakes uh, Training Center and take care of uh, those troopers and show them that Americans appreciate uh, their service. Also, we have uh, from last week's show, which the subject was uh, the POW MIA issue. We have a former POW, Tom uh, Jandarian, with us again. He was captured during the Battle of the Bulge. So we, we want to welcome uh, that participation here in our studio tonight. Tonight's show, tonight's show is going to be dedicated uh, to an individual, an individual that um, uh, epitomizes what the military does for the United States of America. And, and before I talk about this, this great veteran, this fallen comrade, uh, tonight's show, uh, what's being done for our disabled American veterans, there was a, a picture that I, that I captured off of the Internet. And there's a parade in an American city, and there's a Marine Corps unit marching by with the colors uh, blowing in a breeze. Uh, you got the American flag up there fr up front. And the, the, sorry, the sorry thing about the picture is that you have a lot of our fellow citizens sitting on a curb as the flag goes by. And there's one individual, however, standing. And that one individual is a disabled American veteran who struggled, apparently, Kenny, right out, of, out of his chair. And right behind his, uh, him is his uh, wheelchair. To stand up and pay tribute to the American flag. So this inspired uh, us here, the staff at the Veterans Center, to to have the show tonight uh, for disabled American veterans. Now back to the show's dedication. Uh, the show tonight is going to be dedicated to Army Lieutenant Adam uh, Case. Adam Case, born in Oak, Oak Park, Illinois. He's a grandson of Paul and Ruth Rosa. And uh, this lieutenant was killed in an automobile accident on June 25th while serving in the uh, first of the fourth Cavalry Squadron of the Big Red One, stationed in Schweinfurt, Germany, a unit I know quite well. It was the eyes and ears of the division I had the privilege to command as my last duty assignment. And he wrote a letter uh, two days after September 11th, two days after September 11th, a date we all remember quite well. And he wrote it. He didn't sign his name to it, but he wrote it for his whole uh, unit, his troop, his squadron, his division. And it's uh, titled, A Message from a Soldier. And it reads as this. 
To the person responsible, it is obvious to my comrades in arms and me that you have no idea who you are dealing with. So allow me to enlighten you. I am the one million American soldiers, Marines, sailors, and airmen sworn to defend my country. I have been called to give my life in the defense of liberty so that others may live. For America was founded on this principle, and I am so proud to carry it on. Patriotism is not a word to me, but my way of life. The uniform I don every day is the smallest symbol of my commitment to my mission. I wear the uniform of my country because others do not, and so others do not have to. I carry out my mission to prevent others from doing what I must do and from feeling the pain I must feel. And these others are the ones you have taken from me. You have ended the lives of thousands that I have sworn to defend. These innocents were my family. Whether or not we shared the same blood, we all lived together as one. And they enjoyed the freedoms and rights that our democracy has provided, and I have defended for them. Diverse, different, and ever-changing, the people of America are America, and you have challenged this. God help you should our nation decide to let loose its awesome power. For you will not only be faced with me, but with the hearts, desires, and determination of America, projected through the flesh of my men, the steel of my saber, and the lead of my ammunition. You have challenged, and America will answer. You will run the gauntlet of my wrath, and I am the most lethal killing machine ever devised. I combine the technology and raw power of the world's best weaponry with the unrelentless, unrelenting determination and passion of the world's best warriors. You are not a person to me. You are not a human being. You are a target. You are the destiny of the hammer falling in my rifle. So help me, God, I will destroy you. The resolve, the determination, the spirit of Lieutenant Cass is why this show tonight is dedicated to me. And now I'd like to turn this over to my co-host, Kenny DeCamp. Well, I think it's time for us to uh, do a little bit of military quote of the week. Here's today's military quote of the day, brought to you with support from retired Lieutenant Colonel Dan Bogievich. This quote is from our former president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he states, Peace can endure only so long as humanity really insists upon it and is willing to work for it and sacrifice for it. Yeah, that's very true. Well, General Dave, this is our third program, and I'm finding out that more and more listeners are uh, tuning in and sending emails to veteransradio.com, or they're calling our toll-free number at 800 5910020 to get plugged in with us. People like John Murnane in Montana and Mike Sparks in Georgia, Ivan Denton in Indiana, and even Victor Klebanski in Carpentersville, Illinois. Part of this week's Veterans Radio Hour is made possible through generous contributions and support from founder members like uh, our listening audience and people such as Del Wilson and Andrew Palermo who made contributions in memory of their veteran fathers who proudly served the nation. Now, in order to continue bringing these historic shows on the talk radio network at veteransradiohour.com and 97 stations around, we need people to write to different stations and let them know that they can have this show for free, Sunday nights, 9 central, so that we can get more of the word out, get more people involved with us. And now at this time, I'd like to bring you a new segment. General Dave, we talked about this the other day. It, something about taking care of our veterans, something that's very unique that people don't know about. And this was made possible this week from, a, from our webmaster, Mark Eli, a veteran himself, and from his company, GIM Productions. Tell us what taking care of our vets is about. This is a great idea, and I think that it, it's appropriate to, to honor, to acknowledge fellow American citizens that have gone the extra effort to take care of America's veterans. And the story tonight is about the Outback Steakhouse. Uh, not too long ago, the Outback Steakhouse um, flew to Germany. Thousands of pounds of steak, shrimp, blooming onions, near beer, bread, and other uh, uh, condiments 
uh, and then on a, loaded that onto a C-17 aircraft and flew it in Afghanistan. And for three days, they cooked that chow for all the GIs, 8,000 GIs, uh, in Kandahar and Bagram Air Base, uh, taking care of troopers. Uh, and they did it. A lot of people say it was an advertisement uh, gig and this and that. But I'll tell you, to the troops, it was heaven. Well, it was I, heaven. I never heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of advertising? It sounds like. Well, we're helping them out because that was a great gesture. And, and from the Veterans Center, thank you, Outback. That was a great thing to do for the GI. That is truly a great story. We're going to go on uh, into our week in military history. And General Dave, I think you've got some information for us. Yeah, to, uh, let's talk tonight about a little different slant. Uh, instead of a battle here or there, and uh, though they're obviously very significant, especially if you took part in one of them, uh, we're going to talk about the, the armies. Army takes credit, but it's probably all the military. In fact, I know it is. Uh, the Army's best invention. And, uh, just Ken, I don't think you know what that is. Well, I would think a bullet. No, no, not a bullet. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you in a second here. In the summer of 1942, uh, the Subsistence Research Laboratory here in Chicago, uh, 52 years ago, um, made what's known as the P-38. You know what a P-38 is? Oh, the can <laughs> opener. <laughs> the the P-38 C-ration can opener, the Army's best invention. And C-rations, as, as, <laughs> as we know today, have long since been replaced with the more convenient meals ready to eat because you can argue about what's better. Uh, but the fame of the P-38 persists. And the P-38 is one of those tools you keep and you never want to get rid of. And uh, I know a lot of people have had them for 20, 30 years, and uh, they still got the original one they had. In fact, mine, they come, they're silver. Mine's black now. Uh, uh, I, I won't tell you why it turned, turned that color, but it's black now from use, and it's something you cherish almost like your dog tags. Uh, when we had sea rations, the P-38 was your access to food. It was an extremely simple, lightweight, multi-purpose tool. In warfare, the simpler something is and the easier access it has, the more you're going to use it. And the P-38 had all those things. The tool acquired its name from the P-38 the punctures required. I bet you never counted those either. The 38 punctures required to open the sea ration can. And from the boast that it performed with the speed of the World War II P-38 fighter plane. Anyway, well, he also used it for cleaning boots, cleaning your fingernails, the screwdriver, you name it. The P-38 was used for everything, a truly multi-purpose tool, and the, and the government got, a lot of, got its money's worth out of uh, buying those things. We carried it in the dog tags. GIs carried it on the key rings. P-38, the Navy, by the way, called it a John Wayne uh, <laughs> instead of a P-38. And the feelings that veterans have for the P-38 aren't hard to understand, according to First Sergeant Steve Wilson of the Chaplain Center in school at Fort Monmouth. He says when you hang on to something for 26 years, it's very hard to give it up. That's why people keep the P-38 just like they do the dog tags. It means a lot. It becomes a part of you. And so, yes, the P-38 opened cans, but it did much more. Any so soldier will tell you that. That's another good story for today. We're going to go to some of our guests now. Let's uh, start talking about the disabled American veterans and Dave, I think you've got a couple people on the line as well as our friends sitting here at the table. Right, and we do have some, we have some people on, on the line, and I'm going to introduce those. And I, but before we do that, what I'd like to do is go ahead and bring on uh, a key issue just for food for thought for our in, uh, studio guests as well as the call-ins, and that is concurrent receipt of military retirement pay and disability compensation. So the question would be, is there an injustice with the current law, the law that requires that military retired pay be reduced by the amount of veterans' disability compensation? This current practice stems, by the way, from the Civil War era. Uh, that's when the law was initially uh, started. And many say that both the military retirement pay and disability compensation are earned and are awarded for entirely different purposes. Retirement pay is for serving a certain length of time. Disability pay is for pain for suffering. And some members of Congress, like Senator Jack Reed, who, by the way, is a veteran, Airborne Ranger Infantry, 82nd Airborne uh, member, is pushing the Retired Pay Restoration Act to allow a service member to receive both without penalty. So with that, I'd like to go to... Uh, 
an in-house guest, and that is uh, Jeff Hall. And Jeff Hall uh, is a, a veteran of the Gulf War, wounded, the U.S. Army. He joined uh, the professional staff of the Disabled American Veterans as a National Service Officer in 1993. He is currently the supervisor of the Chicago National Service Office. He supervises the DAV's Transition Service Office at Great Lakes Naval Base and serves as director of the service for the DAV Department of Illinois. So with that, Jeff, your comments. Well, as far as concurrent receipt goes, many, many years, as, as you stated, General Dave, it goes back that uh, now coming up to the present time where many veterans served, gave many years of their service, uh, veterans like yourself, uh, that gave uh, more than just the, the normal hitch, served to retirement, and some, many of them suffered from disabilities that were incurred during that time. And it simply is unfair, and has been unfair for all of these years, that veterans would uh, not receive the disability compensation because of military longevity pay uh, being considered that it was, uh, quote, unquote, double dipping. Uh, it's simply not fair. Uh, the bill is in the House. It's been an issue, a very, very hot issue, and our legislative staff in Washington, D.C. is on top of that, and uh, we're trying to gain that support so that that bill passes. Well, uh, you know, let me, let me get a comment on it also from uh, someone that we have on the line who's been holding for a while, and I really appreciate that, and that's Joseph uh, Violante, uh, also a disabled Vietnam veteran, appointed the National Legislative Director of the DAV in July of 97. He served with the 4th uh, Fourth Marine, uh, 4th Division Marines, a uh, practicing attorney, co-host of the former cable TV program Vets Forum, and writer for Tommy, a quarterly veterans law uh, publication uh, from Bowie, uh, uh, Maryland. Uh, Joe, are you on with us? I sure am. Good evening. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, thank you. Well, thank you for joining us uh, with... Uh, uh, so far, Jeff, in the audience, uh, your comments on concurrent receipt bill, please. Yes, uh, the Disabled American Veterans uh, has been pushing this issue for, geez, well over a couple of decades now. And I think we're coming uh, close to seeing some type of resolution on this issue. There are provisions in both the House and Senate um, defense authorization bills that are in conference right now. The House provision would provide... Uh, partial con or concurrent receipt to those veterans rated 60 percent or higher, phase it in over five years. The Senate version would uh, provide for a full concurrent receipt to all uh, longevity uh, disabled retirees. And we're hoping that um, before long we'll know uh, what the status of that will be. I know there's a lot of uh, ongoing legislative work right now. Uh, just uh, like I said, Senator Reid, uh, I know some others are some others are involved. Um, you know, also, if, if we may, uh, uh, Joe, I'd like to bring, bring on also on the phone here Leo, Leo McKay. He's the Deputy Secretary of Veterans Affairs for President Bush. Sir, are yes. you there? I am. Uh, Leo, could you add to that, please? Uh, well, uh, one of your first commentator made a uh, characterization of concurrent receipt. There are a, a lot of things in play and the political process is working. I urge people who are listening to be a part of that process and to write in wherever you are on this issue, but um, uh, to your representative in Congress. But to say that uh, concurrent receipt is, um, is unfair, that something has been taken away from veterans, um, it technically isn't true because the law goes back, as you mentioned, into the 19th century. So nobody who joined the service did so under the understanding in law that they would be entitled to both retirement pay and disability pay. Uh, so I just want to clear that up. And then also there are, uh, you know, several drawbacks of the of the bill. One of the shortcomings uh, that I see in it is that it doesn't um, doesn't make provision for medically retired. So uh, while it does, um, as as Joe said, uh, square a circle that uh, DAV and and others have uh, wanted. Um, uh, change for a couple of decades, if not longer, uh, it doesn't take care of the total retired community. And in some ways, it doesn't take care of the most deserving or some of the most deserving retirees, those who have been medically retired, not by longevity retirement. Uh, and then also, 
the bill, uh, if it is passed, will just have certain impacts, and they are uh, facts. One of the things that's the more generous bill, uh, the Senate bill is passed, uh, it has to be uh, paid for, uh, obviously, and, and we have estimates, no one is really sure, uh, that it would be upwards of $60 billion over the next uh, 10 years. That's an issue for Congress uh, to uh, decide where that money is going to come from uh, and to make it available. As far as the Department of Veterans Affairs is concerned about concurrent receipt, uh, it will have some impact on us, but by, and by uh, a wide margin, uh, the impact falls on the Defense Department. Um, we are going to pay disability compensation, and we pay disability compensation uh, whether this bill is passed or not. There will be no modification uh, in the way we do business. Uh, the Defense Department uh, decrements their retirement pay dollar for dollar for those that receive our disability compensation, uh, which is tax-free. Uh, well, but there's uh, no change in business for us whether concurrent receipt is passed or whether it is uh, not passed this well, it, year. It's a good point, and I think the education, letting people, un making sure people understand uh, the pros and cons of any issue like this is very important. There's only so much money available. Uh, I know the services, uh, this affects also when it's looking at end strength, some of the issues on mm -hmm. end strength, trying to raise the, the numbers in, in the services. You know, you mentioned medically retired, and we have an individual with us tonight uh, in, in, in studio, uh, Ron uh, Hollingseed, uh, a disabled veteran from the Marine Corps. And, Ron, do you have a comment on what the Undersecretary just said? Yeah, are you saying that, uh, that because I'm medically retired now that if, uh, if I, uh, I can uh, automatically apply for this and get it if it was passed, being service-connected? Undersecretary? Are, no, the, the bill just doesn't address medical retirees. Uh, that's a, that's a, a one population that's left out by the bill. Okay, but, I mean, a lot of people don't understand that because I am 100% um, that uh, I automatically qualify for Social Security, so I'm double dipping already. So it's only natural that, you know, guys who would uh, are eligible for just extended retirement should be eligible also. Well, those, are, those are good comments. Yeah. And, and, and you see, that's uh, the one reason that we want to do this show is because there is a lot of confusion. Uh, among the ranks on uh, what, what people deserve, what, what, uh, what's available, how to go about it. And, uh, and what we're going to do, hopefully, from this show is take some of these, some of these issues and make sure people call in, like you just stated, uh, uh, to do that. Um, I, I'd like to go back to Jeff just a second, uh, if there's any issue there. Uh, Dr. McKay, uh, the only question I had, uh, I do believe that it is unfair because nobody joined the military with the intention of being hurt as you point out that nobody joined the military with the assumption that they were going to receive longevity retirement pay and disability uh, compensation from the VA I believe it is unfair because nobody joined the military certainly not I and certainly not you with the intention or with the expectation that they would be hurt and of course uh, we're going to be back in a few moments um, and be continuing to discuss this know that you're listening to the veterans radio hour and we're coming to you every Sunday at 9 p.m. Next week's show, we're going to be having Rear Admiral Rondo on with us, the commander of the largest naval training center in the world. Write to stations near you. Let them know this show is on. They could have it for free. We want people to be hearing and listening and getting involved. You're listening to the Veterans Hour on the Talk, 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 Talk Radio Network. The Veterans Hour now returns to full readiness on the TRN Talk Radio Network. The Veterans Hour proudly presents our military hero story of valor. Tonight we want to honor uh, an individual, disabled veteran. His name is Chad Colley. Chad Colley uh, went to the same uh, uh, officer commissioning program that I did at North Georgia. He's a triple amputee, champion skier. In Vietnam, in the Currahees, 506, uh, he was hit so bad, lost both legs and an arm, he was actually put into a Vietnamese wash tub in a pool of blood, and he was given his last rites. And he said, Chaplain, I'm not dead and I'm not dying. I'm moving out. I have things to do. <laughs> and he remained alive. This man won several gold medals in the downhill in the Super G races at the 1992 Paralympic uh, 
games in Albertville, France. Um, he has the ability to overcome severe disabilities. His enthusiasm is contagious. I have seen him many times since then. He's an unbelievable man. He was awarded the first annual Unsung Hero Award given by the Lois Pope Life Foundation in cooperation with the Disabled American Veterans. Our tribute to you, Chad. You are, are a hero. And now the Veterans Radio Hour salutes the active service person of the week made possible by a contribution from the veteran brothers who served in the Marines, Richard and Lee Gack, owners of AmeriCare Sanitation and Supply in Addison, Illinois. General Dave? Our active duty GI we're going to acknowledge, pay tribute, salute to today is Private First Class Alan Cabrera, an infantryman with Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. Enlisted after watching the attacks on TV on September 11th. He states, the image of the people jumping out of the buildings got me so angry, I decided at that moment to join the Army. He's a Cuban native who came to Miami in 1995, and he says, I wanted to defend the country that gave me my freedom. He's in the final stages right now, becoming a United States citizen. He arrived in Afghanistan in July. Uh, in 100 plus degrees temperature. If you want to send packages uh, to uh, PFC Cabrera or his unit, write down his name, send it to Task Force 1st the 505th Parachute Infantry, 82nd Airborne Division, APO AE 09355. A big hooah to you, Ooh. Cabrera. Yes. Let's go back to the phones now. We've got uh, somebody from Montana. I think General Dave's going on to bring on before we start talking to our other guests. Yeah, I'd like to bring on uh, Arthur uh, Heffelfinger. He's joining us from Montana, as uh, Kenny stated. Art is uh, heavily involved in veterans' uh, issues. He is the health care chairman and state treasurer, Montana State Council, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, and on advisory, he's on the advisory committee at the national level on that as well. Art is a Russian linguist, served in Vietnam, Panama, Persian Gulf. He's an attack helicopter pilot. And he wrote a book uh, uh, called Caring for a Wounded, Treatment Concerns for Montana's Veterans. Art, thanks for staying with us. Are you there, sir? I am, General. Good evening. How are you? I'm well, sir. Thank you. Could Thank you... Uh, I was reading uh, your biograph here as I was waiting, and it, uh, of course, talked about your many credentials and described you as friendly and affable. I'm glad to hear that. Most of the one-star officers I work for, I have a lot of adjectives to use for them, capable and intelligent. I'm not sure friendly and affable would be the adjectives. <laughs> well, I've heard, I, people, I've, there's been a few adjectives used on me, I can assure you. I must confess tonight here, even if it's on radio. Um, Art, uh, if you could join in uh, with the concerns from what you've seen there in Montana. I know you work with uh, the hospital there. Um, you, there's a... Uh, uh, you know, the treatment concerns in Montana's uh, Fort Harrison Veterans Administrative Regional Hospital. As an example, uh, when I say concerns, now, again, this is not a complaint session. It's just let's bring out on a table what kind of issues are out there and what we can do about it. Well, uh, you know, I, I really don't like to draw a distinction between disability claims issues and health care issues. I think they're simply the two sides of the same coin. And the sorts of um, difficulties we encounter on the treatment level in healthcare, we also run into parallel difficulties on the claims disability side. Uh, the bottom line is that that document you referred to, Caring for Our Wounded, went to Secretary Principi about a year ago. It resulted in a federal investigation. As a matter of fact, uh, the Office of the Medical Inspector of the Veterans Administration came first in December with three investigators to Fort Harrison. They returned one month later with nine investigators, and then a third team came in a month after that to take sworn depositions from various Fort Harrison employees. Now, I, at this juncture, General, I'm really hesitant to comment on what I do know of the results of that investigation. I guess I would prefer to wait until the document itself is in the public domain. But let me just give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things that, that have been going on. Uh, treatment delays. And this particular gentleman I know uh, personally, as a matter of fact, over the course of one year, he had six consecutive appointments canceled. Uh, if he had an appointment, say, in January, he'd get a note in the mail saying your appointment now is in March. March will go around, he'd get another note saying it's now going to be June, and so on. Finally, after a 10- or 11-month wait, he got in to see a physician. 
was diagnosed with kidney cancer and had emergency surgery to have that cancer removed. And, uh, of course, during this entire period, he's having some very chronic symptoms, blood in the urine, pain in the side, and so on. Let me, let me interrupt. The bottom line is that there is in place a system which simply does not service adequately, efficiently, and certainly not in a timely manner, the health care needs of Montana veterans. Well, let me, let me uh, okay, let me go, I'm going to go to, to Jeff Hall here. I'm sorry, Ron uh, Holling's uh, seat here a minute. He's a, you know, we, he just talked a little while ago, 26 Marines uh, veteran. He's been shot five times. And uh, what, real quick, uh, Ron, uh, do you have any uh, similar experiences in the hospital here? Yeah, I've had uh, things like uh, appointments have been canceled from one month and set back three or four months. Uh, some of the main concerns that I have that uh, about these is is like being able to uh, receive bandages. It's like when I, I still have open wounds and I go in to get received bandages and I'm told, well, you can only have 30 bandages this month. And I asked them, well, what do I do for bandages? Uh, and their reply is, we can only give you what the uh, VA allows us to give. Well, I, you know, uh, I know uh, Secretary uh, Principe quite well. In fact, we're on the Vietnam uh, Memorial Board uh, together. And uh, I've worked with him several of those meetings, I think quite a bit of him. But I'm, I'm not going to speak for him. Uh, I'd like to actually go back to Dr. McKay on this. Dr. McKay, can, can you comment, sir? Well, uh, as Art brought up, uh, you know, an investigation uh, has been launched, and uh, I think at this point he's also taken the correct stance that uh, uh, until that has uh, come out with its findings, uh, we all need to uh, wait and uh, let that take its course. But uh, these kinds of delays... Uh, are not um, what was intended or what is intended. Uh, the fact is that um, because of a, uh, uh, a massive increase in workload in the last uh, five to six years, um, we are a, uh, a stretched and in some places um, a clearly an overburdened system. Uh, we have a number of uh, steps that we're taking to remedy that. We have supplemental funding that um, uh, came through um, uh, just last month. Uh, we have quite a large increase uh, in the FY03 budget, about uh, $2.6 billion for medical care alone uh, in the Senate version. And um, I hope that uh, we get past this continuing resolution, which it looks like we're going to have, and get to the appropriations bill so we can get those increased funding levels out to the field. Uh, we have had a task force uh, underway for months um, and as the uh, the number two at the department and the COO I've uh, reviewed uh, all the networks plans to uh, attack this backlog uh, and we're doing uh, things uh, like um, um, expanded hours for uh, clinics in some areas in places where we can uh, move personnel around to make more people available for uh, primary and specialty care we've done that uh, certainly the, the stories that uh, your guests um, have uh, uh, spoken about tonight are regrettable. No veteran should wait 10 to 11 months. Uh, we are committed uh, and are, um, are getting increased funds and are working as hard as we can to remedy those things. You know, and on that, I'd like to go real quick to Joe Violante on that uh, because of his position. Joe, can you add to that? I sure can, and and I think everybody so far has been correct. I mean, the problem has been inadequate budgets. It's happened long before Secretary Principi or Dr. McKay has come on board. During the mid-'90s, we went through three straight years of uh, flatline budgets. Uh, the Clinton administration proposed a fourth, and Congress corrected that. But um, the veterans' organizations now are pushing legislation that would provide for mandatory health care funding. It would move the account from the discretionary side of, of the House over to the uh, mandatory side. It would avoid some of the problems we've seen uh, with regards to the supplemental, uh, of which we only got a small part of what Congress um, had requested. Um, also, it would ensure that uh, we wouldn't, the VA wouldn't be hurt by a continuing resolution because each October 1st, VA would 
get uh, the specified amount. They would know uh, several months beforehand exactly how much they were getting, so they can plan for the future. And in less than until that occurs, I think VA is going to continue um, having these type of problems. Okay. Well, Joe, uh, if you could, you can hang with us. We have to break for just a minute. We'll come back to you if you can stay on. Sure. Let's recognize the McDonald's Veteran of the Week, our proud sponsor. Uh, McDonald's salutes its heroes, as you know, from our other two shows. And, and, and tonight we're going to salute Herb Peterson, owner-operator, Santa Barbara, California. Like McDonald's, Herb Peterson always has been a leader. He served his country as a World War II Marine, and he serves his employees, customers, and community as a successful McDonald's owner. Inspired by his Marine father, who died serving his country during World War I, Herb Peterson joined the Marines after college. In 1942, training at a Marine Corps base, Quantico, the second lieutenant was called to duty in Guadalcanal. Within months, Herb was traveling around the world, working his way up the ranks, fighting in historic combat missions, from the invasion of Cape Gloucester to the front lines of Peleliu to the Battle of Okinawa. After the war, Herb completed active duty as a Marine major and began his active duty as a proud Marine veteran and new member of the McDonald's family. Beginning in the mid-1940s, Herb worked at a Chicago aid agency for McDonald's, side-by-side -side with founder Ray Kroc. Herb seized many once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. He attended the company's first convention, helped design great McDonald's ads, and invented the Egg McMuffin, knowing how much Ray liked Eggs Benedict, helping grow the McDonald's business beyond its 30-store operation. Now a proud, op proud operator of six restaurants in Santa Barbara for more than 30 years, Herb never forgets his commitment to the Marines or to McDonald's. In addition to local support of the McDonald's National Salute to the U.S. military campaign, Herb frequently hosts local military recruiters at his restaurants and recognizes members of the military through special restaurant promotions and community events. Our hats off to you, Herb. Wow, Herb, you're a great guy. We're glad you're with us and part of the McDonald's family with us. Let's go to a McDonald's commercial right now. Hi, uh, she'll have a Happy Meal and I'll have the Big Mac. Dad, when will I be old enough for a Big Mac? When you're in college. College. Now, when you register specially marked McDonald's gift certificates at youpromise.com, a portion of the value goes into a YouPromise account for a child's education. So, the more specially marked gift certificates you buy, the more you'll save for college. I want to be a doctor. Hello, gift certificates. Sign up for free and get the details at youpromise.com. We love to see you smile. The Veterans Hour now returns. You're listening to the Veterans Hour on the Talk 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 Radio Network. Way anchor mates, the Veterans Radio Hour now continues full speed ahead on the Talk Radio Network. Aye aye, sir. Okay, we'd like to. Uh, we're going to do a summary now, and this is such an important subject. We have such great guests on. We could do a show with just one of these guys. And I apologize that we only have uh, less than an hour total tonight for these shows. But coming up, we're going to have a Veterans Retiree Benefits show, and we're going to have a Today's Veterans Administration show. And we're going to capture some more of these things because, you know, there's, there's millions of veterans, and, and they have to be taken care of. And so what I'd ask each of our guests to do, and I'll, and I'll ask your name, if you could give us uh, your closing comments. Uh, something you'd just like to, to put out to the American people, to the veterans, uh, about 30, 45 seconds, I would appreciate. And I'd like to start off with Jeff. Thank you, General Dave. Uh, the, I mean, we've talked about a couple of different issues. Concurrent receipt, as, as Joe Violante, our national director of legislation, ha has, has indicated we're pushing that issue. We have worked on that issue for over two decades, and everybody needs to get on board with that. Uh, so that the, these folks can receive uh, their just benefits. Uh, the, uh, talking about uh, the wait times for appointments and things like that, I, I've, I know the VA two to three years ago implemented a health care policy. I'm not sure whatever became of it. It's called a 30-30-20 policy. That's 30 days to wait for an appointment, no longer. Uh, 30 minutes wait time and 20 minutes for the appointment. And I'd like to see them uh, resurrect that. Okay, Ron? I would just simply like to ask everybody listening tonight to please contact their congressmen and senators and ask for increased funding for our uh, Veterans Administration. Here, here. Yeah, the budget's the issue, I think. 
Okay, Art? Well, I think it's more than the budget. Lord knows that's certainly important. Uh, we have, believe it or not, in Montana, in terms of our population density per capita, the highest resident number of veterans of any state in the Union. Yet, in terms of per capita expenditures per veteran by the VA, we rank 38th. We find that discrepancy a bit difficult to understand, and I guess we'd like to see more consistency in VA policy. Okay, I'd like to go to Joe Violante. Thank you. Uh, if I had something to say, it would be that veterans are treated like second-class citizens, that the government should put more money into our program, such as our health care, and they should take care of military longevity retirees, and I'd be more than happy to support Dr. McKay in increasing compensation for those medically retired disabled. Okay, I'd like to go to Dr. McKay then. Firstly, the 3020 uh, standard is uh, place, um, as your first um, uh, uh, commenter said, uh, we uh, manage uh, to get in the in the 80s uh, percent uh, meet those standards about 80 percent of the time. We're concerned about averages because there are those uh, very long waits. Uh, the budget is a big issue. We're in the middle of uh, creating a FY04 budget now. Uh, mandatory funding or uh, the creation of a, a new entitlement for veterans is, uh, is going to be a, is a, is a long process going through the uh, legislative uh, route. We have a crisis in veterans' health care now, and, and we'll have to uh, balance the, uh, our demand with our resources, and we're going to concentrate on those service-connected, uh, poor, and special needs veterans that are at the core of our of our uh, uh, mission at VA. Thank you, Under Secretary. And and I'd like to, you know, on one of these next shows that we talked about, uh, we're going to have uh, Secretary Principe on, and we're going to have uh, Senator Reid and a few others, and and uh, and and go into more depth. Uh, and and the bottom line is not not to uh, uh, it's it's not to complain. It's to fix things and make it right for veterans, those that gave a part of themselves that still walk around with injuries and live with them day to day, and who serve their country, and now the country needs to take care of them. I want to just in summary say that Veterans Hour, like tonight, taking care of Americans, disabled veterans, Veterans Hour is by veterans, for veterans, but it's also for anyone who cherishes their freedom, for anyone who hopes for their future. For anyone who wants a just world for their children to live and grow up in, join us to hear the how the burden of liberty has been shouldered through the service and sacrifices of the men and women of the armed forces, both past and present. Share their stories with a family member, a neighbor, and your local radio station. And if someone or something in this program touches you, reach to some veteran in your life with a call, with a letter, or even an email and tell them, Thank you, GI. The United States of America, your fellow citizens, appreciates what you've done. They truly do. And make that call. Make that email. And General Dave, I'd like to see if you know this. Tell me who, wrote, who said this at his second inaugural address. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, let us strive to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow, and for his orphan. Abraham Lincoln. Exactly. 1865. <laughs> thank you, Art Hal Feldinger. <laughs> Art, send that to us, and I have to thank you, and you're just too smart for me, General Dave. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Kenny uh, DeCamp, I call him, of course, Aide DeCamp, <laughs> is the co-host of the show, and uh, he's a great asset. And we're glad that all of you tuned in with us tonight. Um, this is a very touching subject. It's just too involved for 45 minutes worth of talk, excuse me, talking. We will get back to this subject, uh, as well as many others that deal with veterans' benefits. So stay tuned with us. Be a part of it. Get to your radio stations. Write them a letter. We found out that calling doesn't matter, but there's an FCC law about writing a letter. So send them a letter. Let them know they can have this show for free every Sunday. And we thank you so very much, General Dave. Well, thank you. And, again, uh, I want to thank all the guests for, for giving us their time. And, and I think the veterans appreciate it. They appreciate it. The positions you're in, you can make a difference. You can champion their cause. So, again, we thank our guests. It's all up to you, everybody out there. Be a part of it. Thank you, McDonald's, and thanks to our other sponsors that have been involved.
This show was inspired by the stories of three World War II veterans. My father, Ralph L. Hack from the CBI Theater. Robert Porky Sabarbro, 3rd Cavalry Division. Philip L. Leonard, 2nd Marine Division. These stories are things that we all need to remember as Americans. Hats off to you all. I'm Lance W. Hack. For the Veterans Radio Hour, good night and keep listening.